Howdy, and welcome to part two of my interview with Danielle Vincent. As I mentioned, we had so much fun filming this that it went two hours long, and I had to turn it into a two-parter. So if you haven't seen the first episode, make sure to check it out. We get real about what it's like to work with Oprah, and also about Danielle's mental health journey. And in today's episode, we are going to talk about how she built a business from scratch, raised over a million dollars in VC funding, and ultimately built Outlaw into the multi-million dollar business it is today. So you're really going to enjoy. Before we get started, make sure you smash that like button. If you're watching on video, click that like button. If you're listening to the podcast, make sure to click subscribe and let's get started. Willy Hall. Just your website for anyone who hasn't looked at it, they must, <laughs> must look at it. I just fell in love. My mom sent me your I think, Wall Street <laughs> Journal article and was like, this, this woman is like you. And I just went to your website <laughs> and I was like, I have seen the light of like, what can be, uh, first of all, like the live out law, just.com. Uh, what a domain. I just could just go on all day. I'll try not to, but yes, you are totally my spirit animal. And I'm very excited about Burning Man. Cause I, I myself have been, I miss, I miss Burning Man. Um, and I actually have another friend who did start sort of like a beauty product at home company because of Burning Man. Yeah. Um, but just where did that spark come from? What was the moment where you're like, I want to make goat soap? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, so first of all, we don't make goat milk soap because what I realized soon after learning how to make soap was that goat milk soap is actually quite challenging to make and requires products that go bad and stuff like milk. Um, so we don't do that, but um, we did want to have some sort of a connection of our life in the city to our real life, which was this adventure. And, um, we were on our honeymoon and found a little bar of actually goat milk soap. And it just smelled so great. And every day I would smell it and I would kind of look at it. And I had one bar to use and one bar to just kind of look at and smell. and one morning I looked at the ingredients and I was like, this is not that complicated. Like, and so I just, we taught ourselves how to make soap, uh, using online videos and quickly joined the soap guild, which there's a soap guild. And, uh, and, and then quickly left the soap guild when we realized it was not a badass medieval foundation or organization. Um, and, that was not nearly as medieval as it sounds. Um, and, and, uh, and, and just kind of started teaching ourselves about this stuff. And I look back at that and I honestly, you know, so we did this, we started this business in like March 15th was our official first day. And I think I gave my notice on like April 2nd. So it was like minutes after we started uh, that I decided I was going to quit my full-time job and go do this crazy thing because we had one purchase order that seemed like a big purchase order at the time. And now I look back at it and I'm like, it was like $3,300. Like what the F was I thinking? You know, um, because $3,300 $3,300 purchase order is not enough to live, live on, start a business on. We had no startup cost of, you know, like money. Um, and we didn't get venture funding or I didn't know anything about any of that. We didn't borrow money from anybody at first. We didn't like, I cashed out my 401k so that we could finance the business. And just like, I mean... I look back on it and I'm like, God, that was so stupid. But at the same time, you know, it, it works out. And then, and then now come to find, you know, years later, um, the, a lot of the things that we did because we were industry outsiders actually ended up being very um, strategically advantageous to us. For example, I had no idea that personal care margins would be like 20 or 30%. So I made our margins, what seemed sane to me based on regular pricing, which was, you know, 70% uh, ish on average, you know, across all our channels, including wholesale. And I, you know, really like now I know that that's bizarre but it enables us to make money on accounts that a lot of people lose money on like whole foods. You know, when we got into whole foods, we, um, because of my naivety about the, the 
industry, I was like, okay, well, what do we have to charge in order to make money on these sales? But apparently that's not actually like how a lot of companies are run. And so wandering into that just with, you know, horse sense, not human sense, um, was, was kind of a better, better strategy. Um, at this point, of course, like I now am stag- you know, uh, standing in awe of the number of things that I don't know. Um, and, but that's why I'm hiring better people to do things I don't know. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. It's really hard when you don't know what you don't know, but I think a lot of founders say that Sarah Blakely is infamously quoted for that as well. Like what you don't know is actually an advantage, but um, I, I know how it feels to sort of like feel your way around in the dark. And that's why I think it's so impressive that you've taken it sort of to that level where you I have, have investors, you're in Whole Foods. Like how did it go from this business to this business? That's really impressive and exciting. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. That last year was when we really, so two years ago, I was like, okay, well, if we're going to be a real company, I better get a board of directors together. And so I contacted my very dear friend and lifelong inspiration, Janet, the planet, who was the head of brand for Wonka candy. And she, yeah, she is brilliant, wonderful, creative, unstoppable force of genius. And I was like, well, let's start with her <laughs> and then we'll see who else we should have as part of our board. And, and I also brought in somebody who I felt knew quite a lot about venture funds, but ended up not being as helpful. And then, then Janet brought on somebody she had worked with. I knew we needed a financial genius and she, Janet was like, well, I know the person. And so we all went out to sushi in LA. I met Daryl who is now not only a good friend, he's on our board and he is kind of the directional, he's the, he's the operational compass for our company. And I'm so grateful to have him. In fact, he's my next meeting. Um, And then he said, Hey, I think we should bring on Al, who's the CEO of Nissan noodles Um, at the time. He's not anymore, but uh, he, and now he's the CEO of Barnana, but he will be able to, kind of round out our team. And then with that board, you know, Janet, Daryl and Al and Russ and I, we have been able to get, I don't know. I feel like this is just like, it's, it's, it's such an honor to be in the team or in the company of superheroes. And they have been so helpful in identifying, you know, like, I don't know what makes our brand special because I've lived it so long and they've been really helpful in identifying the directions that we should go and the kind of strategic advantages that I don't even see. Um, And through them, uh, we kind of put together what Outlaw is. And then last year I joined an accelerator program and I'd never even, I didn't know what an accelerator program was. Um, and I just stumbled into some of the best luck of my life um, because I signed up. I always sign up for any free class that I can. And if I make it, I make it. And if I don't, I don't. And I signed up for this thing called Founder University in, in the Bay Area. Now that now it's all digital. But, but uh, I thought, oh, well, this will be good experience. I'll get to go kind of get my feet wet in the Bay Area scene. And I went there and seriously at a, at a road stop on my way driving there, I was like, maybe I should look up what this actually is. And I realized it's a pitch a And I was like, I don't have a pitch. <laughs> and so I like stayed up the night before refining some pitch that I'd given, you know, months earlier. And I was like, I cannot even believe that I this up so much. Like I'm going to be in front of some of the most important people in the VC world. And I don't know what I'm saying. Like, and so I, so I actually did uh, work on the pitch. I, I kind of pulled up my old pitch deck and started refining it there at the, at the, at the truck stop and or at the road stop. And I, I like kind of memorized my lines in the six hour drive to San Francisco. <laughs> so when I went there, I was like, one, 
exhausted and two, like, I mean, I was just afraid. And there's that point at which you're like, so tired that you're fearless. And so I was well beyond the phase of being able to control my feelings about things. And so I just got up there and I apparently nailed it. And they extended an offer to me to join the accelerator right away. And then I almost just was like, eh, I don't want to be, you know, like, eh, it sounds like a lot of equity for like, what is this really going to be? But then I thought about it and I was like, well, I'm here to have a new experience. I've never had the experience of being in an accelerator and specifically what the experience was. So if you can imagine, first of all, I was terrified of investors because to me, investors are uh, bloodthirsty uh, dream killers who will stop at nothing to ruin an entrepreneur's life. And to think about slathering myself in blood and jumping into a shark pool, like seemed like just a terrible idea. And the accelerator was just a bunch of chummy water with a bunch of entrepreneurs like bobbing at the surface. And the, not to be too graphic, I'm sure everybody just got that vision of like a, a ocean of blood with a bunch of dangling legs. And, uh, like jaws, <laughs> exactly. Except yes. bloodier, right? And, <laughs> and uh, and and so what this accelerator was? It was the launch accelerator, and it's like fourteen weeks of every week you meet with and with about twenty investors, different investors every week. So you're pitching for three minutes, which is very not long. And it's no time to explain what a company is, especially a seven-year-old company. And uh, and then you have three minutes to answer their frank and sometimes quite brutal questions. And so it was really like once I, I had brushed it off and then I really evaluated what it was and I was like, oh, I would rather be punched in the face every day. Like... <laughs> And then I thought, eh, run towards the thing you're most afraid of, not away from it. <laughs> like I have a, I have an old saying that, uh, that I read on a little Zen calendar. I can't remember who said it, but it was, uh, when a dog is running at you whistle for it. And I thought, this is it. <laughs> like you just do that. And so, uh, so I signed up for the accelerator program. It was a lot of equity. And I mean, they took like some large percent of the company. I don't know what, what the standard is, but anyway, it seemed at the time like a big amount. And honestly, it was the best because I learned how to pitch. Um, Jason Calacanis is brutal and he is so like, I've never really experienced anybody who is straightforwardly brutal without attempting to be mean. Like he's meaning to be kind. And so he's being straightforward. He's doing it to make you better and not just under the guise of making you better, but like actually like the things he says are like, oh yeah, that's, that, that checks out. And so having him and uh, Jackie and um, Ashley and Heidi on the team, you know, on the launch team, Prash and the whole, the whole group, um, like having them do sound checks with me every week and having them like really, you know, after the first two pitches, Jason stays after and just rips into your pitch. And, you know, that it, it was so good. It was so good. And, um, came out of it with not only a lot of great relationships, um, and some terrific investors, but we actually got our, we wanted to raise a million and we raised 1.4 million and during a pandemic as a female founder, like nobody was raising money and female founders did worse than ever. Um, and so just knowing that, you know, like knowing that that was uh, what we were really up against, it just, you know, I, I had very low expectations for 
whether we could even do it. But what actually ended up happening was that I met with a lot of people and there were some people who were just definitely, no, I don't want to work with these people. And I worked with my coach. I have a, an awesome coach and my coach really helped me get clear about the fact that these, these like investors, if they could start a company like ours, they would. They can't. They literally cannot. And so, you know, and that was the same thing I realization that I had about lawyers. Like, as much as lawyers will tell you how you should have done things differently in the past, there's a reason not a lot of amazing dynamic companies are started in law firms. They just don't think that way. They can't. And so, so being part of this and then hearing their, you know, frank and sometimes quite hard questions that actually made me much better. One guy after my first pitch, I knew I had done terrible and he private messaged me and said, um, I just have some feedback for you about your pitch. And I did not want to hear his feedback about my pitch because I knew it was just going to be, this is terrible. But, um, but I was like, you know what? He doesn't even invest in my sector and he's taking the time to, he's offering to tell me where my weak points are. I'm going to appreciate the fact that he cares so much about entrepreneurs that he is willing to take his time to give me his honest feedback and his feedback made all the difference. He said, I don't even know what you're selling. Your product is so unclear. Your pitch is so unclear. Are you selling music? Are you selling product? And I was like, oh. And so I completely redid my pitch after that first pitch. And it became a lot simpler. It was a lot shorter. And it actually went just so much better. And that was really a huge turning point. So all of these awful situations, you know, like that was really what I raised with last year was just a ring of fire. And by the end of it, um, by the end of it, I really missed it. I missed doing it every week. Um, I missed the people. I missed my colleagues from that cohort. We actually still meet every month um, to just kind of share where we are. I, I just was really grateful for that experience. Um, and without it, I absolutely would not have raised. And what I found out was that investors, the right investors are not only as interested and dorky about business as I am, they are passionate about stats. They're passionate about what makes businesses tick and what makes businesses go, but they also have more experience in different areas. And the best, best ones are humble enough to say, this is what works for me. I don't know. Take it if you want. Don't take it if you don't want it, but just giving you a perspective of what you might want to think about. And that has been phenomenal. Like some of our investors have provided with full competitive analysis of our, you know, of other companies. Um, one of our investors has spent significant time just brain dumping marketing uh, direction. And it, honestly, if we recorded his session and played it back in slow, uh, you know, slow re replay, we could draw a 12 month roadmap uh, that would absolutely result in world domination. I have no question. And these people are just showing up to be helpful. And in addition to showing up to be helpful, they gave us $1.4 million. Like if I had any idea that investors could be so incredible, I would have started with that like years ago, but, um, and be, and being, you know, now, now I consider them friends and I have like the notes that they send me on my desk at work. And I mean, it's just like, I just didn't know it could be so good. I think investors get a bad rap. <laughs> That's inspiring to hear because I have always avoided investors because all I've heard about it was like, you know, in San Francisco, you're going to get 
maybe a situation you don't want on your hands from like a personal me too perspective. And then if you, for the, the men who typically got investing, then you're like, it's like you're in a corporate job again with that manager and it's the same hell that you were trying to get out of. Um, so that's really, really cool to hear actually. Yeah. Like a different situation. I have to say, like, I am part of the women's uh, founder community and I know, like, I know how rare it is that we got funded. Like there's, I think I read the other day that fewer than 2% of women owned small businesses make it over a million dollars. And last year we did 3.3. And I also heard that less than 2.2% of all venture funds go to women owned companies. And I think that is there's a combination of reasons. Obviously, um, I think women are not as likely to go to VC uh, or to investors. And I also did encounter um, some notable people who I could tell were speaking down to me because they did not believe that a woman could be a financially savvy person. You know, I mean, I am a shark. I am a very focused, attentive aggressive financial, like I'm, I'm margins obsessed, you know, and, uh, I will hunt down 30 cents loss, you know, (laughs) and only, well, I should caveat that with, if it's a systemic problem and that 30 cent loss is, looks like it might lead to an $80,000, you know, loss. I will unravel a sweater um, to find it. Uh, And I think the people who decided to invest in Outlaw, it it was for the best that if there was no chemistry, I did not pursue those relationships. And I think that that's one of the things that a lot of people, especially when I hear about women raising money, if there's no chemistry, just bail. Like it is not worth it to be in business with people who aren't a good fit. And when there was amazing synergy, amazing, like there's, there's some companies out of Chicago who I've been talking to um, bridge investments is one of our investors and they, I like, I don't know. I just, I've never met them in person. I want to hug them. They're so great. And, um, and they're just so smart, bright. They, want to be of service because they know that their service to me is what's going to help us all succeed, not them calling me every 15 minutes to ask if I was going to hit my February numbers. You know, that's, (laughs) that's like, honestly, just having those people on my team, you know, uh, small investors, big investors, like the check size, I decided to take on some smaller check sizes just because I wanted those people on my team and I didn't want to like miss the opportunity to have them part of outlaw. Yeah. Um, So I have so much respect for them and, and they, they seem to have great amounts of respect for me, which my imposter syndrome just has a, has a flag day parade over that one, but you know, you do what you can. (laughs) That's awesome. I know. I think those respect is well-deserved, especially because it sounds like you took this business pretty far um, before going the investor route. It sounds like you would recommend investors, but what was like the bootstrapping process like, and what are you able to do now that you're kind of, you've got like this team? Bootstrapping. It was horrible. <laughs> I'm bootstrapping right now. And I'm just like, oh yeah. my gosh. Like I learned how to turn on the the money machine with Facebook ads, but then I have to go make everything myself, which is like, yes. Oh, it's so, did you, did you but like, yeah. you know what? what, can I tell you, yes. like I'm better at creating our ads than a bunch of our agencies have been. And yeah, I fired two agencies, one of them for, for other reasons and that their ads weren't performing, but, um, I have good success creating our own ads. And I think on some level, we are the best people to tell our own story, you know? Um, So from that perspective, I think bootstrapping is important. And also knowing, like, for example, this year we're going to, we're scheduled to, I mean, fingers crossed, knock on wood, um, 
we're scheduled to turn a profit this year. We did not turn a profit last year. Uh, but every other year when we were bootstrapping, we had to turn a profit because otherwise we starved. And, <laughs> and so like having the ability to know how to turn on a profit, even if you have the luxury of not having to turn on a profit, you know, turn a profit is, um, I think, a, a beautiful thing. And then I actually had to hire a coach to teach me how to spend money. Um, uh, yeah, I have that problem too. <laughs> yeah. Cause like yes. once I got investment, he was like, you have to spend this money. Like you have to hire good people. You cannot hold on to this money in some sort of a scarcity mindset. You have to use this money to grow to the next level. So, you know, that's what we've done. We've really hired, I got a director of operations who is incredibly skilled, has a lot of industry experience, has worked with co-manufacturers and fulfillment partners and everything, and uh, is has experience training and hiring people. All of these things we have failed over and over to do well. And then uh, we hired in December, I brought on a marketing manager. And what I learned also is that now that I have venture funds, one of the beautiful things about having venture funds is that I can actually hire a recruiter. And I found the best recruiter. If anybody's interested, um, I, I can send, I can send you her information. But she uh, she and I met at like in happenstance about seven years ago. And um, and when I knew I needed to hire people because we got this funding, I was like, I'm just gonna call Angela and see if she's available. And so she has landed us like Davida joined us in December as our marketing manager. And she is so incredible. I, I did not know it was possible to have somebody, uh, just, I just trust her. Like she has, and, and it's not like, I don't trust a lot of people. Um, that's m maybe a, Good thing, maybe a bad thing, but sure, it's been a lot. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just trust her so implicitly that when I realized that we needed to get into SMS messaging and that we could really kill that, like we could do really well at that because our customers are very conversational and text is great conversation. So um, I had no reservation about, like, hey, Davida, do you want to take on this SMS project? And she said yes. And I thought, I don't even need to be CC'd on these emails. Like, I don't, I don't have to be involved. She's going to nail it and I can just not have it on my agenda. And yeah, I mean, it's amazing to have that. Like, and I, the first thing I did was I said, okay, you get to set up. Cause I, in her inner, I always do interviews that like have a problem that I'm trying to solve. And in her interview, um, I said, so we're having this problem where, um, we have all these people who want to submit photos to us, but we can't take photos from them because I'm disorganized and I don't have anywhere to store them. And so, and like, I want, I want to make sure that we have all their model releases and everything like that. And she said, you mean like a digital asset management system? And I said, um, that sounds good. What is that? And she said, well, I just set it up for MGM because we were, uh, you know, having a lot of problems about like, were our, were our images licensed for this kind of use or this kind of use where, you know, and so now we can file, you know, sort by tag and, you know, everything like that. And I was like, that sounds like exactly what we want. She said, yeah, we can like also expire photos on a certain day. And, da -da -da -da. and I was like, that's even better. That's even a thing that exists. Can we send these things to like press? And she's like, yeah, that's the point. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this thing exists. So right away, as soon as she started, I was like, you're doing the digital asset management. And so she just took that on. She set it up within like, you know, she, she evaluated all the companies. She got budget approval and like now it's running and I sent photos to the press all the time. So having a recruiter who is able to, you know, collect um, referrals and find the right person with the right attitude and the right spirit and the right team. It's been one of the greatest experiences ever. Um, so I, I like, I consider Angela part of our team. 
That's so great. Oh my gosh. I, I love that you're building this uh, team of outlaws. Did you find, I know hiring is a huge thing. There's like those plateaus as you scale. What were some of the plateaus you hit and overcome? It sounds like you're, you've jumped over that hiring plateau, which is so great. And like outsourcing, which is the thing, but um, yeah, definitely. So I am a marketing person and Daryl, our, who I mentioned, who's on the board, he has repeatedly said to me, a sale is not just getting somebody to buy something. The sale is not complete unless you have the product that you can get to the person. That is the end of the transaction. <laughs> and so I had invested a ton in marketing and really worked hard at marketing, but we were never able to get actually fulfill on our, like, you know, we had to keep turning off ads because we were promoting products that we were out of stock of. And, you know, and so that was a big revelation last year was if we don't invest in the inventory, we can't like all the money that we throw at marketing is, is a waste because we're just not fulfilling our, you know, we're not able to build the momentum that we want to build if we keep running out of stock of stuff. And so you know, really focusing on hiring uh, and, and putting a lot of money into our production team while cutting back on our marketing is hard for me because because um, I really love marketing. It's like one of the reasons I got into this. Um, but uh, but that has been really important. And 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 you know, as as you said, like there's points at you know you really out. I hate to say it, but the, as a fat, well, I'll say it in the way that my mentor and friend told me. And he said, when you're growing as fast, when your company's growing as fast as you're growing, people's capacity to learn is going to be exceeded. And so people are not going to be able to learn as fast as your company's growing and you're going to outgrow people. And you either have to find them a different seat on the bus that's a lower level, but most people don't want to move down in levels. So you generally have to just let them go when they don't fit in the seat that they're in anymore. And that was so hard. That has been really hard because people can be the perfect person for where we are right now, but in two years, the worst person. They can be the weakest link because they don't have the experience of the scale at the level. And so you always, and, and similarly, if you hire someone for a position, we learned this, you know, a hard way, which was if you hire a position that is the person you're going to need in two years, but they don't have the ability to start something from scratch or deal with a high amount of chaos then <laughs> then you're not hiring the right person there either. And so with a really fast growing company, we're basically a different company every six months. Um, and that's hard. You know, the fact that a year ago, we didn't co-manufacture most of our products and now we do means we can supply at a different scale and a different, you know, the fact that we outsourced our fulfillment and last year we were handwriting notes on every order. These are just different levels of the company and present different challenges. And if somebody's stuck in a world of we have to handwrite notes on every order, they are going to not be able to see the ways that we can provide a personal experience at a mass scale that we need to, um, you know, we're, our, our hope is that we're going to, you know, like when, when the wall street journal article came out, we, you know, we did 1.2 million in, in 2019 and last year we did 3.3 million. And this year we're supposed to do 8 million, which is a bonkers number to me, but the only way we'll be able to do that is through creating a scalable personal experience. And, you know, the thing that I always tell every person who works for us from production to, you know, e-commerce, VP of e-commerce is we want to be scalable in the places where it does not matter at all. 
Like nobody cares if I personally type in their tracking number into their shipping email, right? Like who cares? But to be non-scalable in the ways that it does matter, which is building relationships and hearing people's legitimate concerns and, you know, uh, responding to Facebook comments and truly remembering who people are when they write many times, you know, that is a connection that is a non-scalable connection. And those are important connections. To me, we're just being us. Even our customer satisfaction enthusiasts, we don't train people to be nice. We just hire nice people. Like we don't write in a way that is meant to manipulate people. We just write in a way that is ourselves. And um, that is something that I really learned from Oprah. She responds to a lot of her own viewer comments on their website. She responds to people on Twitter herself. Like she manages her own Twitter account. She is so authentically her. And I thought, you know, not everybody can be Oprah, but maybe if we get together 20 or 30 people, we can begin to approach the level of connection and authenticity that she has. And I still go in there and I answer Instagram uh, messages and comments and connect with people. And, you know, like, uh, I worked customer satisfaction tickets the other day, cause we were short staffed and with the outlaws I interacted with, you know, we've been in contact for years, some of us, and they are genuinely my friends. Like one of them had a complaint and he voiced his complaint, which was a legitimate complaint. I was like, ah, oh, Craig, I'm so sorry. Totally hear you. You've been writing about this for uh, so many years. I know you have, I'm going to go home and I'm going to get my personal candle because I know you missed out on the sale and this is not fair. And so I went home and I got my personal blazing saddles candle, which I hadn't yet lit. I was like, the packaging is going to be all because it's a prototype, but you deserve this. And he was like, oh, now I feel like an asshole. I'm like, don't feel like an asshole. You are being honest and you are absolutely correct. This is an unacceptable situation and I want to remedy it. So it's so great to be able to continue to have these relationships with the customers. And and in terms of the people who are starting their business, like your customers are in a relationship with you, whether or not you want to feel like that's a friendship or a transactional relationship or a adversarial relationship or a manipulative relationship or whatever you want that relationship to be, it really is up to you as the business owner to define that. And you're going to be married to these people. Like you're going to be married to whoever it is that you attract as a customer, like, you know, as customers. And, and so you better like them. And I like to tell our uh, longtime outlaws, like the reason that we are so fanatical about service and about communication and about being authentic is because they're worth it. I mean, if we had a bunch of, bunch of ass customers, then who cares? But our customers are so awesome. They're out, you know, they're firefighters and first responders and military and medical workers and like the, just out there doing stuff, having adventures, being helpful, you know, ha- like the, you know, for outlaws, there are a bunch of the most like people with most integrity that I've ever met. Um, people write me and, you know, the number of people who, if we accidentally include an extra item or a wrong item in their order, mo- most of them, okay, maybe not most, but probably close to half will actually be like, you know what though? I want to pay for this thing that you sent me by accident. And it's like, no, dude, you don't No, I'm not going to make you pay for our accident. And they're like, but I like it. I'm going to use it. And to have those kind of customers, like, you know, that's, I don't know. I mean, like, like, that's what it's really about for me. And we don't have that connection with people uh, in broadcast media. You know, we cannot have that connection with people when we're doing TV um, or anything like that. But online, you can have a great connection with people and it's fun. We can build a brand together. And Every week, except for this week, um, of course, because you know we're busy, but we've been launching all the products that our customers have asked for over the years. Like we did candles for three weeks, 
Now we're going to do deodorant starting next week. And like, we're just doing these limited edition sales of everything people have asked for, you know, for the whole time we've been doing this thing. And it's like really fun to build a business with them, you know? I love that. Yeah. That's the lesson. I mean, Zappos and Chewy and dare I say Amazon is, is, but that's how I am too. Just that customer service part of it, because yeah. you love your customers so much too. And that's why we're in touch because, um, you yeah. were so responsive to me when I reached out with my hero. And I'm worship. sorry it took me so long to like get back to you because it's so no. funny. I was that day I was working tickets, customer satisfaction tickets, because they were so far behind. They were 400. No, they, yeah, they were like 500 customer satisfaction tickets behind because we were over the holidays. We lost one employee um, and uh, they, she, she moved on and then another one caught COVID. And so like was out for a couple of weeks and um, she's fine now, thankfully. Um, but we just did not have. And then, of course, during the holidays with all the carriers overloaded and everything, we were getting you know, 50 emails a day, where's my package, where's my package? And we just couldn't keep up with it. And so we were so far behind that we were having like customers, every time I posted something on social media, customers were writing really scathing things. And it hurt my heart to hear some of the things that people were saying about our business, like our business is a scam. They've tried writing us so many times and we haven't written back. And so I was like, that is enough. So we, you know, we hired a bunch of people um, in mid January and a week and a half ago or so I was like, look, I know I answer tickets really fast and all day today, I'm going to reschedule every meeting I possibly can, but all day today, I'm going to answer tickets. And if anybody beats me in the number of tickets that they close, I will give you a hundred dollars each. And (laughs) and we had five people working on it and only one person beat me, which was uh, amazing. Great show by our, our customer satisfaction team, but we, we closed 471 tickets in one day. And that was a record. I really have been inspired by Susie Batiz's story. Are you familiar with Poopery? Mm-hmm. Oh, you should check her out. Um, yeah, I mean, Poopery has been an incredibly interesting story. She's now on the Forbes, like, richest women list. So she's been doing a lot of uh, press about it. But she talked about that they had this viral video. And she, yes. you know, on the outside, everyone's like, wow. And on the inside, she's, like, crying on the office floor, like, shipping packages. And I, oh. yeah, <laughs> I have my own experience with that, too, when um, my business kind of took off from Etsy see last March. And, you know, I was really excited because my phone was like, cha-ching, cha-ching with all these orders. And then I'm like, I have to fulfill all of these now. So I hear you. Yeah. It's, it's the less glamorous side of e-commerce they never include in the like Forbes 40 under 40 list or whatever. They're, they're- <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm over 40, but yeah. And last, so in December when Brooklyn got COVID and it was just me and VO, the customer satisfaction manager at the time, like answering tickets, I literally cried myself to sleep at night. Yeah, that was it's hard. Brutal. Yeah, it's really brutal. Yeah. And, and you, I think are on social media. I was on the front lines of social media for a long time. And it, yeah. that's, it's a tough place to be. People are, are rough. People there, are so. mean. They oh are so God. mean. I know. But then there's also yeah. so many amazing people. And I also was writing back and forth with somebody who I didn't look at her signature file because it hides it when we're responding to tickets. But she, she and I were just kind of bantering back and forth. And I was like, so what do you, you know, what do you do? She's like, you know, cause she said she was writing and I said, what are you writing? And she said, uh, this. And, and I realized that, oh, right. She has a, a link to her stuff in her signature file. She is a retired rocket scientist, uh, from I think NASA. And she now writes science fiction and is one of the highest rated authors on Amazon. Wow. For sci-fi. And That's I was cool. like, I cannot even believe I'm just emailing you like a regular person. This is so crazy, (laughs) you know, um, but it's just, it's like, you know, when you're in there and um, people can be really mean, but also people can be so delightful. You have to take the good, you take the bad, you take them both. And then you have the facts of life. I mean, it is a mixed bag with customers and we just have to accept that like not everybody is going to be our customer. And we, probably aren't going to be very good friends with people who just write us in all caps with a bunch of uh, profanity. And so we just let them go, you know? (laughs) 
and that's okay. Yeah, that's completely yeah. okay. And those one cus- those customers that are so kind and glowing, like really yeah. makes up for it. That's what attracted me to e-commerce for many years because I figured out if you have one boss, there's like one person that controls your life. If you have several mm-hmm. clients, there's a few people. But if you have customers, it's like you crowdsource. And then I agree, there's this relationship that is indescribable. And for people who have never run an e-commerce business, I just have to say like that first sale or when you support local business, it's so exciting and so meaningful. Um, and I'm, it's a shame that with these corporations that starts to get removed um, and the customers become kind of like this persona. And I was actually surprised. I was, that was one of the concerns when you do anything from like a YouTube channel to a store is the mm-hmm. haters. But I think if you've got haters, it probably means you're doing something right, actually, because <laughs> you're putting yourself out there and that's cool. The haters were surprising to me at first. And the, the, the one star reviews on Amazon sometimes can get quite personal for you feeling. And, you know, like the, the internet is a wild place, you know, just like we talked about earlier, nothing is personal. It's all about them. It's not ever about you. And it doesn't, it's fine. <laughs> That's true. That's just like such an important skill to learn, whether you're gonna start your own business or being corporate America, either way. Yeah. So one that I yeah. still work on all the time, but it's, it's like an ongoing journey. Yeah, it's hard. My, my biggest struggle right now is like, having frank conversations with people whose work is not living up to my expectations. That's like my big thing right now is, is having those conversations. And, and the true thing is that it is a gift when you can have a frank, loving, uh, empathic conversation with an employee who is not living up to your expectations, because then they're never blindsided by the feedback or anything, they know where they stand all the time. It is much harder to have like somebody just come out of the blue and say something like your work isn't living up to my expectations, but I am such a coward when it comes to delivering straightforward, honest feedback, because it's just, it's just really hard. I hear you. I have the same issue. I mean, and and that's something I hear from a lot of founders as well, right? When you're the creative type that wants to come in and like create the art masterpiece that is your business. And then you wind up being a manager and that can be a real grind. (laughs) So have you kind of had to deal with that as well? Or have you now been able to outsource managing relatively quickly? And, And like, what is your management style? How do you, how are you pulling this off? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I still really struggle with it. Um, And, you know, I'll use an example of an employee who um, recently left. I absolutely love this person. I'm not going to mention their name. And um, they really had a superficial handle on a lot of things, like a lot of things. But when I started looking into the deeper parts of things, I was finding massive financial losses that they were just not considering, um, including, you know, more than $83,000 in misplaced product and, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in external shipping costs that were excessive. And um, I didn't know how to talk to them about it. You know, like, and that was one of the things was they felt until the very end, like they were doing a terrific job. And when we would butt heads on something, they felt like I was just looking for a yes man or something because I had not been honest with them all along the way. And that was a great disservice to them because I feel like this person really could have taken my constructive feedback. And could have really grown as a person and been a terrific employee. And at the same time, the, you know, I just didn't have, I didn't have what it took. Uh, And, and, and that's still something I struggle with. Um, And I, and I possibly will struggle with it forever, or I might get better at it. I trust that I will get better at it. (laughs) That's, that's so extremely wise and like incredible that you own that. I have found that myself with managing people is like, I always try to say if something didn't work out, it's on me because I should have like trained them or communicated better. But that's, I mean, that in itself just shows though, that you are a 
excellent leader. So I'm really impressed with that statement. I have to say, Thanks, but it's but hard. Still <laughs> no doubt. It's hard. Yeah. Could have saved this person. You know, <laughs> um, I do hold myself responsible for it. Sometimes I don't like, right. Like, you know, there's times when I am super great about it. I'm super clear. We make a job description. We establish performance criteria. They don't live up to them. And then I'm like, whatever, like, they understood the criteria and it wasn't on me and we went through the criteria and that was it. And uh, then there's times when I'm like conflicted about it and, and think I should have just been a better leader. Um, and, 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 and also um, my coach does often remind me and, and, and God bless her for this. Like she often reminds me that, that it's, it's not all on me um, and that, that I can be, as very, I can be very clear and people can like do their own diligence and educate themselves. And I can expect people to um, have a certain standards that there are certain, like losing $80,000 of inventory is a reasonable thing that I could expect somebody to not do. <laughs> That is absolutely true. That is so true. So that would I mean, be. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't yeah. have to be like, please don't lose eighty thousand dollars worth of inventory, because um, that would really damage our business. You know, it, that's like, you know, that's the thing. Um, thankfully, we are getting that money back because uh, because our director of operations submitted a claim for it, and now we're going to get that money back. So, like, you can always turn it around. I think everything that's non fatal. <laughs> Where do you want to take things next? Um, I can only say so much because of two reasons. One, I don't want to tip my hand in terms of the overall competitive strategy for Outlaw. And two, if I actually tell you what I think is going to happen, um, you might have me locked up for delusional thinking. But um, but, There's no um, dream too big here. It's okay. (laughs) I mean, I... I truly believe that um, Outlaw's mission, so my personal mission in life is um, as concisely stated as possible to help people be the fullest expression of themselves at their best. So however you are at your best, to be the fullest of that you can be and to show up however you are in that moment as the fullest expression. That's my supporting role. Right. I am here to support that. I am not here to personally, you know, uh, feed the poor or anything uh, or 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 bandage people's wounds or heal pets or, you know, there's a lot of wonderful, admirable things that people do in the world. My thing is to help people live the fullest expression of themselves at their best. And um, I wrote a book uh, called Unicorn and uh, I like basically am ceaselessly and relentlessly dedicated to that. So everywhere. So to me, without law, our unique sense and our unique company approach is entirely in support of being of people being themselves and celebrating who they are, whether, you know, and that's why when people say, oh, it's a men's grooming brand, I'm like, get out of here. Like (laughs) I wear our products and I know a lot of women who wear our products and I know a lot of, you know, of all gender people who wear our products and who love our company and who you know, hear the call of what we're saying, which is that you are amazing and we want you to be like, show up as the fullest expression of yourself at your best because everybody is unique. Everybody has a different thing to bring. And if that person is not bringing that, then, then the world is missing out. Right. And that is like, I, I believe that's so, so, so much in my core. And every time people are not showing up as the fullest expression of themselves at their best, like that's when people get hurt. That's when people are um, disappointed. That's when people are stolen from. That's when the earth gets polluted, you know? And so everything that I do has to be around that. And that's what outlaw is. So we get, we hear from people all the time, like, like, um, last or two years ago, actually now at this point, um, in June, I was in Dallas at a trade show and we got a Facebook message from a, um, nine 11 response, first responder. And he w- suffered from PTSD. And he said, 
that he just needed to let us know that his experience of outlaw, um, he suffered from PTSD to the extent that he really couldn't even leave his apartment and his personal hygiene was suffering. But since he found outlaw, he has been able to really start taking care of himself and he can see a different way out. And I, first of all, bawling at a trade show show is never a great luck, but like, um, I would but, cry. I would definitely be yeah, crying. That's right. Amazing. I mean, and so I actually blew up his quote, um, and put it on our wall at work because I always wanted to remember that this is what it's for. And we hear from people all the time, like that hair of the dog reminds them, you know, somebody wrote and said that they opened their package of outlaw and they had all these different products in there and, you know, they they had their dad smell it and they had their mom smell it. And, you know, the dad said, Oh, that's interesting. And she said, you have to understand from my dad, that's crazy high praise. And, and I was like, cool. And she said, but my mom smelled hair of the dog and started crying. And she, she was like, this is dad. This is, and her dad had died, you know, years in the past and she had never been able to like have closure around that. And this bar of soap reminded, I'm going to cry. Um, this bar of soap, like brought him back just for that moment. And it was like such an emotional, wonderful connection that they got to share as a mother and daughter over this person who was no longer in their lives. And that's like really, that's just so cool. And, and so being able to do that with scent as a powerful memory trigger um, and be able to forge these genuine connections at a time when people are feeling more disconnected than ever. Um, being able to show up for people when the world is confusing and chaotic and people are more divided than ever, being able to say kindness is important. Like that is what I think we stand for as a company. And I think that that is not going to go out of style. That makes my heart sing. I just love, <laughs> I love that mission, especially, you know, with your story and background. Tell me, like, what do you hear from people? Um, the bridge is out ahead. What is the bridge? The bridge that I see everybody getting stuck at is the co-manufacturer slash manufacturer. So right. there's a lot of like Etsy projects that die as Etsy projects um, yeah. and just outsourcing that. So I would say that would be the question I know for me as well. Like I'm trying to get that done right now and uh, oof, like just finding a person to work with is a whole thing. So I didn't even know what a co-manufacturer was until like three years ago. So we thought we had to make everything ourselves from the very beginning. And we thought that we had to, um, and especially in order for us to live up to kind of our brand, I don't ever want to be inauthentic or not genuine or lie to people um, about what we make and who we are and what we do. And so I thought if we weren't making things ourselves from scratch, we were being inauthentic. Um, and unfortunately, that is a very difficult to scale. Um, and so co-manufacturers, actually, there's something, so there's private label, which is where you take somebody else's existing product and you put your label on it. And they basically, you just, you just, you're the marketing department for a blank labeled product. It's also called white label, um, but private labeling. So you can like private label things. For example, if we were to make a sunscreen, um, I don't want to go through the regulatory BS of ensuring SPF levels and stuff like this. So I might private label something um, and have them add our scent to it. And then that would be, you know, a private label product. Um, and we would provide the design for the um, packaging and they would just produce it. Co-manufacturing is when, at least as I understand it, is when you come up with your own formula and you define the formula for a person who will manufacture it for you and then do the filling and the labeling and all that stuff. And they basically send you the finished product, but you're the person who originates the formula. So for example, like our lotions are 
co-manufactured. We spent a lot of time working on the formula for our co-manufacturer or for our lotions, getting the lotion exactly the right thickness, getting it not greasy, you know, like getting it to all of the qualifications that we needed it to have. We could only do 300 bottles a day if we did nothing else. And so we found a co-manufacturer who could reformulate based on our exact same ingredients. We didn't even change our labels. And then, uh, and, and then, uh, sent, you know, add the scent and everything so that it was exactly how we wanted it. And then now they ship it to us on pallets of 2,600 minimum order. You know, we're just ordering 13,000 calamity Jane lotions and sorry, I have to math this. Um, uh, let's say 13,000 at 300 bottles a day, it would take us 43 days of doing nothing else but making Calamity Jane lotion just to make that amount. And we'll probably sell that amount in three months. So um, so having a co-manufacturer really allows us to keep our product quality standards and um, keep our customers happy because we actually are able to supply that amount. You know, there's some things that we still make in-house, like our uh, handmade bar soap. We train people how to do this. It's really a craft. Um, and it, like we can scale up that, but there's that's very difficult to have co-manufactured or outsourced because of how volatile the scents are, because of the exact artistry that we want. We, we, we invented some of the methods that we use to do this master batching is what it's called, um, which I think is hilarious. Um, <laughs> master batching is a great word. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, so that's co-manufacturing is basically giving people, giving a mass manufacturer a formula so that they can mass manufacture it for you. Private label is taking something that is already in existence and putting your own label on it. Is that, would you say that's a fair Yes, I think that's a perfect definition. And um, I think that's a lot of people don't know that I realize I'm a little business obsessed, but then finding that contact and then also like putting down, do you think the investors kind of enabled you to do that minimum order quantity that you have to invest in? Absolutely. And we even so at, when I first started fundraising, I was talking to some people who didn't really understand how it worked. And they said, well, if you're going to sell it, why don't you just get credit terms? I'm like, who's going to give me like a hundred thousand dollars in credit on no experience? Like they don't know who we are. And he was like, oh, well, if you have the orders already lined up, I'm like, we direct ship to customers. Like customers are going to wait two months, you know? And so, um, so, so there's, a lot to getting set up with contract manufacturers. And that's what we used our investor money for last year was really building those contract contacts, um, outsourcing that production and, um, you know, getting that stuff going. It has not been, I will say it has been a real rocky road and um, because quality standards, you know, like um, we had not come to establish quality standards with one of our co-manufacturers and, a whole batch came and it was unsellable. And because we didn't have any agreement in place as to quality standards, we just have to eat that cost and move forward with that co-manufacturer or cut off ties with that co-manufacturer. But we just had to learn a hard lesson about standards. Thank you for being so generous with your time. This has been a total, like a blast this for is, me. This so. has been the highlight of my week. Um, oh, second only to emailing with my VP of e-commerce <laughs> this morning, but like, this has been just a really lot of fun. So thank oh you gosh. so much for having me. Oh my gosh. No, please. You have the highlight of my week. It's an honor. Um, <laughs> I will, I'll do this anytime. Like anytime you want to be on a podcast, you just call me. Well, are you on clubhouse? We should do a clubhouse. We should. I've been meaning to join because it's all anyone talks about. So I will join your clubhouse. Thank you for bringing me into 2021. I need to like get up, up speed. <laughs>
I was blown away by Danielle's bravery and honesty, and I learned so much in this episode. The level of authenticity that she is able to achieve is just extremely impressive, so it's no wonder she's so successful. I wanted to do a quick recap of everything I learned from this episode, and I also want to know what you learned, so please leave in the comments and write a review and let me know what your big takeaways were. But the things that I really was impressed upon from this interview was what you don't know can actually help you. I've heard founders say this time and time again when starting a business. Uh, in Danielle's case, she talked about how it impacted her margins and how she priced a 70% margin instead of a 20 to 30%. And in my own experience, that has been true as well. It's really critical that you properly price your product products to account for margin of error that's naturally going to occur if you're a bootstrap founder or building something from scratch. So that was number one that I learned. Number two was to get outside help. And this is something I think everyone struggles with, which is delegation and outsourcing. And Danielle, has done it really well. I'm so impressed that she reached out to what sounds like an incredible board of directors and is now having a really successful experience hiring a team. But also just with the daily struggles that everyone has to learn as a manager, which is to constantly be giving feedback updates to your team so that you give them the tools and knowledge that they need to grow and excel in the role that you've placed them in. And another thing that I learned from Danielle that was really awesome is to define the customer you want. And this is something that's popped up a lot in founder advice, but you don't have to cater to everybody. You don't have to please everybody all the time. Uh, you get to pick as a business owner what kind of client you want to work with, what kind of customer you want to work with. So why not work with people who are kind, generous, uh, exceptional people? So that's up to you to figure out who you are most compatible with and treat it like a relationship, treat it like a marriage when you define your ideal customer. Another wonderful takeaway that might be my actual favorite is embrace your fear. So as Danielle said, if the dog is running at you, whistle for it, which I think is a great way to describe exactly how you should face your fears. Uh, I think all of the interesting stories in my life and all of the accomplishments that I can claim are because I just looked fear straight in the eyes and ran directly towards it. So ask yourself today, what are you afraid of and how can you embrace that fear uh, to be more brave? And I would also say a really great feedback piece that I took from her is learn how to take hard feedback. Throughout Danielle's career, from corporate to pitching to investors, she received some really hard hitting feedback. And instead of turning away from it, she faced it once again and she digested it, processed it, and became a better person for it. So I really admired that part of her story a great deal because it's not always easy for us to face our own flaws uh, or shortcomings, but it's the only way to grow. And on that note, it's also important not to take other people's drama personally. So there's definitely a line between somebody who has your best interest in mind and is giving you feedback with the spirit of improvement versus that customer who's freaking out on Twitter or that client who, you know, is calling you at 11 p.m. melting down. So if that scenario is happening or if somebody's being verbally or psychologically abusive as happens in your day job, uh, it's really important to just think to yourself as this is happening, it's not me, it's you, which is almost always the case. Um, and then finally, I would say embrace opportunities. I think Danielle said she signs up for any free class she can, whether she attends or not. And funnily enough, one of those classes turned into a founder investment pitch to her luck and surprise and ultimately to her success. So always be seeking out and embracing those new opportunities. Don't shy away from learning. Uh, in today's age, it's more imp important than ever that we stay on our toes and keep learning. So that's what I learned from this episode. I would love to know what you learned. Comment below or leave a review. Uh, as always, please smash that like button if you're watching on YouTube and hit subscribe so you can get the next episode next week.